Major funding for Election 2020 Arkansas PBS Debates provided by AARP Arkansas. Hello again, everyone, and thanks very much for joining us. I'm Steve Barnes, and we continue Debate Week here on Arkansas PBS. At this hour, the race for Congress in Arkansas's 3rd District. The candidates in alphabetical order, Michael Collegius, the Libertarian nominee, Celeste Williams, the Democratic nominee, and U.S. Representative Steve Womack, the Republican nominee, and the incumbent. The candidates will be questioned by a panel of Arkansas journalists, Doug Thompson of the Northwest Arkansas Democrat Gazette, Una Lee of KHBS KHOG, and Randall Seiler of The Courier. Each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement. Each will have two minutes to respond to a question. Rebuttals are limited to one minute. And of course, each candidate will have two minutes for a closing statement. Now, the debate sequence was determined by a drawing in which the candidates or their representatives participated. And our timekeeper tonight is Cindy Gamble of Arkansas PBS. As we begin, we note that we have followed all protocols for the COVID-19 era, especially distancing and masking. Our masks were removed only moments ago. And with that, our first opening statement is from Ms. Williams. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panel, Arkansas PBS, and those of you at home for taking the time to become better informed before you cast your vote. I am not the traditional candidate you're used to seeing here on the debate stage. I've been a nurse for more than 20 years. I am a wife and a working mother of four. People are frustrated by their elected officials who spend their time sowing, telling us who to fear, fighting one another, and sowing national discord, rather than solving the problems of everyday Americans. We are facing a national public health crisis and economic crisis as well. Willful ignorance is not what American exceptionalism is all about, and it isn't patriotic. Truth and science are neither liberal nor conservative. We need leaders who will create a roadmap to a better future, a future where none of us go broke because we get sick, where we have world-class educational opportunities from preschool to vocational school to college. And we restore the dignity of work by ensuring all workers in America are paid a fair wage. And we honor our promises made to seniors by protecting Medicare and Social Security. Taxpayer money should, be, should benefit all taxpayers not just the extremely wealthy or corporate donors. We need an advocate in Washington who will govern in a fair manner and fight for all of us in the 3rd Congressional District. Ms. Williams, thank you. Mr. Womack. Thank you very much, Steve, uh, for the opportunity to Arkansas PBS uh, for this forum to be able to discuss and discern the differences between the various candidates uh, seeking public office, not just in this particular race, but in the other races that have been chronicled here in uh, recent debates. I want to thank uh, Randall, Yuna, and, and Doug also for their participation here. And, and look, I, I'm going to tell you straight up that I appreciate the fact that Celeste Williams has uh, thrown her hat in the ring, her candidacy, if you will, uh, to represent the voters in the 3rd District. Michael Collegius, who is uh, been up here before, but uh, again, thanks to him for his willingness to serve the people of the 3rd District. I, I've been in Congress now for the better part of 10 years. I have a front row seat to many of the issues, all of the issues that face our country, but also have a unique uh, perspective on the issues that are specific 
to the third district of Arkansas, and I'll talk more about those a little bit later on. But we're at a crossroads in this country. There is no doubt that this particular election, though we say it every four years, may be the most important election in our lifetime. I believe that is a statement that is true uh, in, in this particular case, more so than maybe ever before, certainly in modern history, because our country is, is going to have to make a decision between the direction that it's going to take. Is it going to be a government that is going to be government-centric, that's going to be uh, too large, uh, take too much of your tax money. It's going to expand government programs to the extent that we pile on more debt than what we've already g accumulated for our, ch our children and our grandchildren. Or is it going to be a government that for 240 plus years have served this country very well? A, gum a, a limited government, a government that pushes as many of these issues down to the states as possible, a government that believes in the rule of law, personal accountability, personal responsibility. Those are the ideals that I fight for every day in Washington, and I'm looking forward to two more years to do just that same thing. Well, Mr. Womack, thank you. Mr. Collegius. I also want to thank AETN for inviting us all out here today and for hosting this debate. My name is Michael Collegius. I'm your libertarian candidate for U.S. Congress. I'm a retired school teacher. I'm a veteran of the United States Navy. I've served on the board of directors for a multi-million dollar nonprofit. And I currently serve my community as a volunteer firefighter. I am a product of the American dream. It's the American dream that our government is increasingly making harder and harder to achieve. Our nation is $27 trillion in debt. Our entire economy is only $19 trillion. The interest alone on that debt is over $300 billion every year. That's not sustainable. The moment every American is conceived, they owe a debt to the United States government of over $82,000 each. I want you to think about that. Look at your children. Think about your grandchildren. <clears throat> before they make their first mortgage payment, before they buy their first car, get their first job, take that first student loan, before their first day in school, their first steps, or even their first breath, they are already $80,000 in debt. We need to fix that. <clears throat> we need to fix that by voting differently. If we don't fix that, we're going to run out of money to treat any of the other problems. There won't be anything left for education. There won't be anything left for Medicare or any kind of health care or to save Social Security. There won't be enough left for our national defense. We need to change that by voting differently. We can do that this November. Please join me in doing so. It hasn't mattered whether we've elected Democrats or whether Republicans have been in power. The result has been the same bad government. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is insanity. Stop the insanity. Vote Libertarian with me. Thank you, sir. Doug Thompson has our first question tonight, and it goes initially to Mr. Womack. Congressman, there's no need to go back over the grim statistics of the pandemic. We've all been living this for eight months now, and to some extent, we're all in the same boat. But the people who have borne the brunt of this from the beginning and are still bearing the brunt of it are the essential workers and the families they go home to. And even among them, the people, the point of the spear, so to speak, are minorities who disproportionately make up the number of essential workers. If you're black or Hispanic, you have a three or four times as great a chance of contracting this disease as a white, white person. The worst case I know of is the Marshallese in uh, Northwest Arkansas who represent about 3% of the population of Benton and Washington counties and at one point accounted for one half of the deaths in those counties. Why were these essential people in underprotected communities left so vulnerable and what should be done about it? Well, Doug, you speak of the, uh, the issue that grips, as you know, the in entire country and uh, not just our uh, beautiful third district of Arkansas and indeed uh, the minority communities that, that you speak of. Look, this pandemic um, hit our shores and did not come with a playbook. 
Uh, and in many respects, our country was caught somewhat unprepared in terms of, you know, the personal protective equipment that I'm sure uh, my nurse opponent down here will speak to here briefly, um, but also in terms of, uh, of preparing ourselves for the potential economic calamity that would ensue this particular uh, pandemic. Um, and there, there are very difficult decisions that have to be made many times on the fly as you're trying to deal with uh, something as unknown as COVID-19. Uh, and and I th look, I think our, our Marshall East community and uh, maybe to a bit lesser extent, but not too much of a lesser extent, uh, the Latino community and others uh, in our society uh, just basically uh, were affected in, in such a way that uh, the particular cultures that we all come from uh, probably reared its ugly head. You know, in, in a lot of the cases in the, in the minority communities, you have cultures that live in very close proximity to one another, in some cases, many families to a, a given home. And so the ability to socially distance and to be able to create separation from one another is made difficult. Some of the workplaces in which a lot of our minority communities happen to work uh, make it difficult to socially distance. And, and it took us a while to be able to get the best management practices in place and the proper protections installed to ensure that they do not you know, you know, infect one another. Uh, but again, we are still trying to find our way through this pandemic and trying to find the sweet spot, that, that, that very difficult and elusive place where we can keep our economy moving and at the same time provide for the public safety of our people. All right, Mr. Womack, thank you. Ms. Williams. Thank you so much for that question. Um, you know, certainly COVID has disproportionately affected our neighbors who are people of color. Um, there's no mystery as to why that occurs. Anybody who works in healthcare understands that those social determinants of health are what affect a person's overall um, ability to be healthy and live a productive life. And those are things like having educational and economic opportunities, a good paying job, benefits that allow you to get health care. And so when we see communities that are disproportionately harmed by that, that is, of course, why. So I would like to say that there was a playbook actually left by the Obama administration and the Trump administration disbanded our pandemic preparedness team. So in hindsight, that was a really bad decision. No one who works in healthcare thinks that this is an acceptable outcome of where we are right now. The United States has unmatched manufacturing capabilities. We have unmatched biotech um, companies. We have a tremendous amount of intellectual resources that are housed in the CDC and NIH that have been undercut by the Trump administration, who, you know, we all are suffering in this time of pandemic. And we needed leadership to bring us all together to defeat this common enemy. And we haven't gotten that. And we are, we are dying in a lack of leadership in this country right now. It's not two different choices between economy and health. We have to tackle both, and there's no improvement in our economy until we address the pandemic. Ms. Williams, thank you. Mr. Kalagius. Yeah, the least privileged among us always bear the brunt of bad policy. Um, it, it's been that way throughout, throughout history, and it's happened here again. Um, the pandemic caught us flat-footed, not because we had one bad president or two, but because we have had decades and decades of bad policy that goes back to not just presidents, but our Congresses that pass all these laws. We have certificates of needs laws that make it illegal to have adequate supplies to address a pandemic. The reason there aren't enough respirators, the reason there isn't enough PPE equipment, the reason there aren't enough doctors or enough hospitals isn't because President Trump dismissed the pandemic team. It's not because there was a lack of leadership. It's because we have laws that prevented us from doing that. We got bad data. You cannot make good decisions on bad data. 
the reason we had bad data is because there was no way to collect good data. The FDA and the CDC have restrictions that made it impossible for our industry, which is very capable, to provide any of those tests that we needed to get that data. We had companies that had tests ready to go. They knew that this was coming. They'd seen it in Asia. They had already prepared these tests for Europe, and they were not allowed to distribute or use them. Not in this country. The CDC wouldn't allow it. The FDA wouldn't approve it until the CDC finally came out with their own tests and found out that they did not work. By then, it was too late. We were acting on bad data. Even the data we do collect can't always be trusted. We've politicized everything left and right so that now we don't even know what numbers we can believe. It depends on who's reporting the numbers and how they interpret them. This pandemic may have caused as little as 2,000 deaths or more than 200,000, but we can't trust the data because, depending on who's telling the story, depending on who's interpreting the numbers and how they're doing it, the numbers are wildly different and wildly inaccurate. Until we can change that, until we can stop this left-right divide, until we can get the government out of the way so that the people that have skills and knowledge can actually do their jobs, we will not see any improvements. Thank you, sir. Mr. Womack, back to you for a one-minute rebuttal. Well, only to say that it's very easy to, uh, to armchair quarterback the pandemic and be able to throw a lot of criticism toward the president's way. Look, the president was handed a, a bad situation to begin with, and I, I don't believe there was a playbook that came with this pandemic because nobody on the other side has offered up anything other than more testing, more contact tracing, those kinds of things, which seems to be out of the uh, decisions made by the coronavirus task force led by Vice President Mike Pence. Uh, but I will say this about the funding of the institutions that support America's response to the pandemic. If you go back in time and look over the last, well, I know for the 10 years that I've been in Congress and for a while, as some of you know, I served on the Labor, Health and Human Services Subcommittee of Appropriations for two different terms. We threw more money at the National Institutes of Health, billions of dollars more year over year, and more money at the Centers for Disease Control year over year. So I don't think it's about resources. I just think it's about the fact that we were misled as a country going in as to the origination of the uh, coronavirus and had to play catch up from then on. And now I finally, I think that we have finally at least began to make inroads into the best practices that help protect us against the pandemic. Thank you, sir. Ms. Lee has our next question and that goes first to Ms. Williams. All right, and Ms. Williams, there are businesses and in industries turning to the federal government for financial assistance during the pandemic. From restaurants to airlines, millions of people are being laid off. And just last week, airline companies started cutting 35,000 employees after their $25 billion bailout expired. So now they're asking for more money. How do you prioritize who gets federal dollars and who doesn't? So my bias is always to make sure that we are putting money into the hands of the everyday citizen. I think we need to make sure that we are not just bailing out cruise lines and airline industries, but making sure that we are reinvesting taxpayer money into the actual taxpayers and make sure that those who are out of work for no fault of their own are able to keep a roof over their head and feed their children and so I certainly support additional stimulus, especially for those who are out of work and to make sure that people are able to meet their basic needs when there's not another job that they can go get right now when we have record unemployment. And then I think from there, we need to make sure that we're actually addressing the pandemic, that we have a national strategy in place so that we can make sure that we are testing, tracing, and isolating appropriately. And certainly we all have to model appropriate behavior. I certainly have been concerned of how many people in Washington have gotten the coronavirus simply from not following the recommendations of experts. Masks, hand washing, those things work. My husband who is an emergency room nurse actually contracted the coronavirus several weeks back and we immediately isolated and socially distanced and no one else in my family got sick. Yet we look at the White House and so many people have gotten sick that I'm quite concerned that that's actually 
a huge national security risk. And we need to make sure that we are protecting our frontline workers, our essential workers, and make sure that we're reinvesting money so that they can get the PPE that they need and we can all be protected. Ms. Williams, thank you. Mr. Kalagias. Yeah, financial assistance for those that have been harmed is going to be hard to do because there are no reserves of cash in the U.S. government. As I've mentioned before, we're $27 trillion in debt. We don't have any money to give any financial assistance to anybody. So any money that the government gives, it has to take from someone else. And in this case, we're stealing it from future generations, from our grandkids. So any financial assistance that we give out now, realize will have to be paid back with interest by our future generations. And that's the problem with having generational deficits on increasing debt year after year after year is that when something like this comes along, we no longer have the resources that we would need to be able to deal with it. That's, that's the problem with having irresponsible leadership in government when we should have servanthood. So it is very difficult to deal with this. The government has created, because they had bad information, created bad policy. It's caused record high unemployment. It has caused terrible things to happen to the economy. Worldwide, the economy has gone down because we are the world's economic leader. So, and probably the economic damage will cause more health problems, more deaths among the world's population than the pandemic itself did. That's why we need to have changes in government. We need people that will make better decisions so that we can make good decisions based on good data instead of having to try and scramble to make up for and deal with the bad decisions we've made in the past. Thank you, sir. Mr. Womack, two minutes. Well, the, the, the first thing you, you don't do is that you don't continue to double down on flawed policies that are not targeted and very transparent and temporary. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, in the early stages of the pandemic, knowing that we were facing a very uncertain future, uh, the Congress of the United States, and I voted for it, uh, put together a several trillion dollar program called the CARES package. Now this is after the original eight billion that went in initially and then the family's first package, but that the big one, the CARES package, uh, which, which put some money into some programs that um, quite frankly, uh, put a moral dilemma on a lot of workers in our country because we were guaranteeing them $600 a week of additional income uh, un, un, under unemployment, in, un, unemployment insurance, which was uh, markedly more money than a lot of these folks were making to even work. And at the same time, we have job creators and business owners trying to get back to work and, and at least get some semblance of, of economic activity going in their business. They had workers that wouldn't come back to work because the government had created a policy that made it more lucrative for them to sit at home. That is a terrible moral dilemma and a government policy should never put its workers under a moral dilemma like that. The other policy was, uh, th that is absent in this whole discussion is when a business does get ready to come back to work, what can we do to give them certain liability protections so that if they're using the best known guidance from the CDC, best management practices known to the industry, that they can bring their people back and not fear the bevy of lawsuits that are sure to come if somebody were to get infected on the line. Those are the things that we could be doing right now to soften the blow of COVID as far as additional stimulus and those kinds of things, as, as Mike has said. I mean, we are 27 trillion in debt and this money will have to be paid back. So it does have to be targeted. It needs to be temporary and it's gotta be completely transparent. That's two Thank minutes. You. Thanks, Mr. Womack. Ms. Williams, one minute. Thank you so much. You know, if a worker says that they do not want to return to work, then they actually lose that unemployment um, insurance. So that, that's not really a thing that occurs. You know, that um, we do need to protect our essential workers. As an example, when my husband was um, off work for being sick, he was offered um, workers' compensation. So his check was one third of the amount of his normal paycheck. And during that time, my mortgage did not go down to a third of what it was. My kids did not suddenly quit eating as much and only consume a third of their normal food. We do need to make sure that we are prepared 
to support our essential workers. And the way that we do that is we utilize our tax money for actual taxpayers and we don't cut taxes during economic times of good. Randall Seiler has our next question, and it goes first to Mr. Kalagius. Yes, sir. Uh, as you know, the uh, Senate right now is trying to seat a Supreme Court nominee and trying to get that done by the end of the year. Uh, do you agree with this approach uh, towards seating a uh, nominee in the election year at the tail end of the year like this? That's yeah, you know, as you said, that's the Senate and not the House, so it's kind of outside our, our sphere of influence. But, but I'll, t I'll take the question. And I, I think Merrick Garland deserved his day uh, when he was appointed by Obama in the last administration. That's the Senate's job. Their job is to advise and issue consent when the president makes a, a nominee. President Obama made his nominee. The Senate should have done its job and advised and consented. It did not. This time, they've decided they've done it. It's it's party politics, I recognize that. So it's, it's right versus left, and it, it's creating more of a mess, which is why we need to get rid of that right versus left paradigm. So, but yes, I do believe that the current nominee deserves her day in front of the Senate. She deserves her chance to, to be nominated to the court. Um, it's up to the Senate to do their advice and consent, which, which they are doing now. Um, but I think that there are a whole lot of senators that should have been thrown out of office for not doing their job at the end of the Obama administration. Mr. Womack, two minutes. Well, as Mike said, this is not in our lane. Uh, I can only speak maybe from the perspective of, uh, of a taxpayer. And, uh, and, and I will tell you that you know, senators are elected for a certain amount of time. Presidents are elected for a certain amount of time. Um, the, the, the vacancies that could occur on the Supreme Court are not confined to the first three years of a presidency or in the first two or three years of a, of a Senate senator's tenure. Uh, they happen at any time, and unfortunately, with the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we have seen the need for a, a, at least a vacancy on the court and the need to fill that vacancy. The Senate, uh, uh, the president has done his job uh, to tell the president that he shouldn't appoint somebody is telling him not to execute his Article II powers. He has that constitutional authority, and I believe the constitutional mandate to nominate. Now, the Senate is a totally different area. I mean, as, as Mike said, advise and consent. It's their job uh, to, they're not required to hold hearings, but in my opinion, should hold hearings, have a full vetting of the candidate, uh, and then take an up or down vote. Uh, the reason it's going to happen this year is because elections have consequences. The Senate is in the hands of the GOP, and the presidency is in the hands of the GOP, unlike it was four years ago when when we had this first round. Uh, so, I, you know, I believe the president should nominate as he has done. I believe the Senate should hear from the, the witness and take the up or down vote, which I believe they will do. And I believe that Amy Coney Barrett will be seated as the ninth justice on the Supreme Court. And nobody should complain about it because it is within the constitutional authority that we all up, swear to uphold when we take the oath. It's within the constitutional authority of the two bodies. Mr. Womack, thank you. Ms. Williams, two minutes. Thank you so much. I also agree that this is more of a Senate issue than a House issue. And certainly I was disheartened that Merrick Garden Garland did not get a Senate hearing. And I think that was an unfortunate precedent that was set at that time. And now we've ratcheted up the political temperature on this issue and really politicized the courts. And I think the more important question is, what do we do about it and where do we go from here? You know, I've seen some interesting proposals um, from some of the Congress, uh, Congressman Rokana who has suggested term limit limits for the Supreme Court justices so that each president would then get two um, Supreme Court justices to nominate and take that pressure off those political battles. And really we need to make sure that we are investing in a functional democracy. And so I understand that that would likely cause a um, debate where it would have to be a constitutional amendment. But I think we really need to look at how do we turn the temperature down? How do we stop screaming at each other from one side of the aisle to the other? And we need to really work together to be able to make, 
to just reduce the temperature of that so that each person can, the president is supposed to be able to nominate a Supreme Court justice. And so he obviously has that right. But people are scared because they worry that their health care is on the line and they're looking at the court decisions that may be upcoming that will be before the Supreme Court. Mr. Kalagias, one minute rebuttal. I, I, I think this issue illustrates one thing probably better than, than any other issue that we're going to have here, on, and that's the need for having third-party candidates. We have an excellent third-party candidate, a libertarian candidate for U.S. Senate this year in Ricky Harrington. If we did not have partisan politics in Congress, then these problems would go away. Merrick Garland did not get his day in the Senate because the Senate was controlled by the Republican Party. Okay. Now the Democrats are howling because the Senate still has, is still controlled by the Republican Party, and so now Trump's candidate is getting their day in court. How much better would it be if the Senate had no power in party, no, no party in power? If no party has a majority, then the people have power again. So that's the way to fix this problem. She said, what do we do about it? That's what we do about it. Start electing third party people into the Senate so that no party has power there anymore and they can start doing their job. Next question from Ms. Lee, and it goes first to Mr. Womack. Congressman, um, in an earlier interview with 4029, your challenger, Celeste Williams, told us, Congressman Womack has had 10 years in office and his biggest concern has been fiscal responsibility. Under his watch, our national deficit has ballooned, and that is in large part to the fact that we had a massive tax cut for billionaires and multinational corporations. I want to give you a chance to respond to that. Okay, well, uh, look, I've, I've heard the narrative uh, from the National Democratic Party. It's a page out of their playbook, and she's reading that playbook, I'm, I'm sure as well she should. But let's just throw a couple of facts on the table. After the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, for the next three years, this country had record revenues. Let me say that again. After the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, up until the COVID crisis, which I think we could all agree is a, is a major hurdle for our economy to overcome. Record revenues. The problem is, it's not that we tax too little. Of, of any uh, uh, socioeconomic means, it's, it's not that we tax too little, it's we spend too much. And most of that spending is on the side of the ledger that is what I call on autopilot. I'm the former chairman of the budget committee. I rank on budget right now would be chairman if we were in the majority. We, we've not done a budget since the last budget that I proposed as budget chairman to be able to finally start whittling away at the programs and the waste of government and the expense of government and start finding our way onto a fiscal glide path that is sustainable. The fact is the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act helped the lowest quintile of workers in America, those lowest earners, lifted out of poverty thanks to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Remember, it almost doubled the standard deduction. It did double the child tax credit. So to say that it didn't help the, the poorer earners in our society is just a misrepresentation of the facts. And then to go a step further in the HEROES package that is held up right now by the Senate, thankfully, Nancy Pelosi's package removes the SALT cap deduction on high wage earners that pay a lot more in state and local taxes, that's in the HEROES package. So my friends on the other side speak with a little bit of forked tongue when they start talking about how Two. we want to take care of the rich, and yet they're doing that in their legislation as well. So I, I just think the numbers speak for themselves. That's two minutes, Mr. K uh, Mr. Womack. Ms. Williams, two minutes. Thank you so much. I too agree that the numbers speak for themselves. In fact, from 2016, we've had increasing deficit spending every single year. We are also now in a time where we have a record trade deficit. It is the highest of all time. We are saddling our youth with a tremendous amount of national debt that risks our national security. It means that there is less money for our safety nets and it risks programs like Social Security and Medicare. Congressman Womack did put forth a budget. I believe that a budget is a moral document that shows 
where you want to invest and what you value. And in that budget, there were cuts to both Medicare and Social Security. You know, when you look at our tax system, nobody wants to pay taxes. I think everyone must pay their fair share and not a penny more. But when we look at the top 99, or the 99% of us pay about 7.6% of our wealth. And when you compare that to the top one-tenth of the 1%, they only pay about 3.2%. And I think that's wrong. The top 50 in our nation, the most wealthy, the amount of people below, that have an economic status below them that it would take to equal their wealth is 165 million. We have rising inequality and we have to make sure that we allow every American to have a chance. Thank you. Mr. Kalagias, two minutes. Yeah, this, this question kind of takes uh, my entire closing statement away. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, both, both of the candidates have said some things that are right. Um, that, that's my issue is the national debt, and, uh, and, and yeah, he's been terrible at it. Um, in the 10 years he's been in office, it's over $12 trillion that we've added to the debt. So, but it's not like before he got into office we were doing any better. Uh, we've been pretty consistently adding to the debt every year since 1957. And he is right that we don't have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem. The problem is, is that he's also voted for all of those spending bills, and he's voted to lift the, the debt cap every time it's come up for a vote. So as he mentioned, he, he was the chair of the budget committee. He sat on the budget committee. But we haven't had an actual budget get passed in the entire time he's been in office, much less a balanced one. So. I, I'm glad this question was brought up. Like I said, it's, it's the, the hard issue of my campaign. So, but I'm, I'm not in the top 1%. I'm not rich, I'm, I'm not poor. I'd say I'm probably in the top 50%. But my taxes are a whole lot more than 7.6% of my wealth. So I'm paying over 50% of my income every year in taxes. By the time you get done with my payroll taxes, by the time you get done with income taxes, sales taxes, property taxes, gas taxes, food taxes, and all the other taxes that they keep adding up on us, it takes me till after July before I'm finally earning money for me. Until that point, it's all going to the government. I can't afford to pay any more. So we need to work on, on this problem. We need to balance the budget. We need to do that not by increasing our taxes, we need to do that by controlling our spending. And there's only one candidate up here that's going to be willing to do that, and that's me. Mr. Womack, one minute. Okay, well, first of all, uh, the budget that I presented in 2018 for fiscal 19 balanced in a nine-year, you have to do it within a 10-year window. We did it in a nine-year window, and, and not with gimmicks. I knew that when we presented our budget that we had to put forth a document that could actually put America on a more sustainable fiscal glide scope. And we did. Now my opponent, uh, way down at the other end, says I cut Medicare. Now I, I would yield time to her if she could explain what that Medicare cut is. She probably doesn't know because she's talking, she's using talking points. Or maybe she could explain the cuts to Social Security. Here are the facts. There were no cuts to Social Security. We just simply made a change in our budget that would make it impossible for you to collect unemployment compensation and disability at the same time. That's the only Social Security change, okay? Let's be specific. And on Medicare, very simple change. Elevate the age of eligibility from 65 to 67 to equalize it with Social Security. I will argue this, if you can't make some small have, change to these entitlement to, programs, I have to interrupt then Mr. how Womack. can you tackle the bigger issues? We're really running over, Mr. Womack. Uh, next question from Mr. Seiler goes first to Ms. Williams. Yes, ma'am. Um, we've seen unprecedented attacks on public health and clean air and water in this administration. And I just wonder what steps would you take in Congress to advance strong environmental rules, including restoring and strengthening the rules that have been rolled back? Thank you. That's a really important question. And I think that it is very important to think about 
the planet that we're going to leave for our children. So I support a revenue neutral um, carbon tax that would help us curtail that. Additionally, I think we need to think about our energy usage, where we get our energy, and really invest in the energy and the jobs of tomorrow. We need to stop subsidizing fossil fuels, and we need to make sure that we are incentivizing clean energy. And that's not just a save the planet kind of solution, but it's also an economic opportunity. And I think that we need to then make sure that we are preparing our children for the jobs of tomorrow by making sure that they are educated and able to get job training so that they can do those jobs, such as solar panel installation, such as windmills, you know, whatever those huge opportunities are, we need to make sure that our children are prepared for that. So additionally, I think we need to make sure that we are protecting our environment, that we are really investing in making sure that we have clean air, clean water. And again, that comes back to the budget. What do we want to invest in for the common good and make sure that every single American has an opportunity to succeed with making sure we have clean water, clean air, Mr. Kalagi has two minutes. Um, I just got done talking about all the different taxes that I have to pay that's taken all my income and now we're going to have a carbon tax too, just, just what I needed. Um, clean energy is tough because there is no such thing. Um, that No matter what you do, if you, if you take it out of one spot, you're going to take it from somewhere else. There's, there's no free energy. So if you want to go to solar panels, then you have to mine the materials, you have to make those solar panels, you have to ship those solar panels, and then it can't generate baseload. So, and the pollution that you make creating those solar panels cancels out any gains that you get from the electricity that's generated by them. So as long as we have people using energy, we're going to have energy that pollutes. The fortunate thing that we have in this country is that we have clean air already we have clean water already. So we, we, we kind of already took care of that. You know, if you go to Mexico, what do they tell you you have to do? You got to drink bottled water because their water isn't clean. We don't have to do that here. We have clean water. So if you go to China, and I've been there a couple times, you don't wear a mask because there's a pandemic. You wear a mask because the air is horrible. We don't have to do that here. We can see blue skies. Most of the regulations that got repealed were regulations that had never taken effect in the first place. They were done with a flurry of them at the end of the Obama administration. Trump went ahead and repealed them all because none of them were done by the legislature, by the, by the Congress. They were all done by executive order. And they were orders that never had a chance to be implemented. So when they were repealed, it didn't change anything from what we had before. So that's my policy on that. I would love to see cleaner energy. The best thing we can do is conserve energy, use less. So walk more drive less. So that's about the best you can do. Thank you, sir. Mr. Womack, two minutes. Well, we all want clean air. We all want clean water. And the great thing about representing the third district of Arkansas, we have it in abundance. As Mike said, you know, you don't have to drink bottled water. You can get it right out of the tap and it's pretty good, pretty good water uh, with very few exceptions. And the air we breathe in the beautiful Northwest Arkansas area uh, is unlike anywhere really in our country, save for maybe a, a few of the mountainous places. Uh, look, I believe in an all of the above energy approach. I do believe that the ability for this country to transition from fossils to a more greener energy platform is available, but it should not be done in such a way that we just hit the switch and we just, as California has done, and basically put a date on the wall and say, you're not going to be able to have uh, combustion engine cars uh, driving down the streets of California. I, I just think that we've got to be very careful as we make this transition, one, not to uh, commit a lot of federal resources to prop it up because that is making the market. And I don't think the federal government ought to be in the business of making the market. And whatever we do, we have to make sure uh, that we can supply the 
reliable energy sources that can power the grid so that we can keep our e economy going. And I don't think solar or, or wind energy by itself is gonna be able to deliver that for us. So, uh, and then lastly, let me just say this, there's been a lot of talk about the Green New Deal. Uh, and a lot of my colleagues on the left have signed on to the Green New Deal. In fact, we have a candidate running for president right now that's signed on to the Green New Deal. If that's the answer, uh, for the energy challenges and the clean water and clean air challenges facing our country today, then it's a very bad uh, solution that, that's being offered up. I believe in market-based solutions. Let the private sector do what it does best. That's innovate and create opportunities uh, that lead us to better outcomes. Ms. Williams, one minute rebuttal. I would also like to add that I think that there seems to have been a move to withdraw from leadership by our country recently. And I would like to see us rejoin the Paris Climate Accord. America has always been a leader. And it is with our leadership that we innovate, that we come to better solutions. And I think that we're missing an opportunity. Whenever we step back, then other people are waiting to fill that power vacuum. And so if we want to let China and Russia lead, then we should step back and do nothing. But I don't think that that's who we want being our global leader right now. We need to be leading because I don't think that either China or Russia have the United States best interest and heart. Thank you, Ms. Williams. But we go immediately back to Ms. Williams for a closing statement. We've reached that point in, uh, in our broadcast. Ms. Williams, you have two minutes. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to talk to not only our panel, but most importantly, those at home who are trying to make their decision on how to vote. I think that what we need right now is someone who understands the struggles of everyday Arkansans. I think that if we want our problems solved, then no one is coming here to save us. I think that no one pay, cares about Arkansas like Arkansans. And if we want to do better, then we need to elect a different person. Congressman Womack has had his chance. He has spent 10 years in Congress. And certainly one thing that we haven't gotten to talk about is health care. And as a family nurse practitioner, I have spent my life serving those in my community, making sure that they get the care that they need when they need it. And one of the big reasons I got involved is because I wanted to make sure that nobody would go broke just because they get sick and that we address the high cost of prescription drug coverage. And certainly, Congressman Womack has been in Congress for 10 years, and if he wanted to solve that problem, then he could have. His only bill he's put forth has been on a commemorative coin. And I think we have to have someone who will work for every single member of the 3rd Congressional District. We've certainly heard some rhetoric about the Green New Deal and liberal left agenda. And I haven't heard those words spoken of from anyone here, only Congressman Womack. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about the real problems people are facing. Thank you. Ms. Williams, thank you. Mr. Womack, two minutes for a close. Thank you once again to the panelists. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. And to Arkansas PBS, thank you uh, as well. We've had a discussion tonight on a number of topics that have relevance to the election of 2020. All very important uh, issues, you know, climate change and, and what to do about energy and COVID response. And we haven't had a, a lot of chance to talk about national security and some other hot button issues, but deficit and debt certainly has been in play here tonight. But I wanna finish in the last 90 seconds of my time to talk about something that nobody else is talking about here tonight. And that's how important it is that the member of Congress representing the 3rd District of Arkansas know and understand the district. And I would argue of the panelists here today, of, of, of the contestants here today, that I have the most intimate and unique knowledge of the issues affecting my constituents. From the consent decree that is affecting 
the citizens of Fort Smith, Arkansas, that have forced sewer rates to go up 167 percent, to dredging to a 12-foot depth, the MCARDs, the, uh, the river navigation system, so that we can bring more commerce up the river, the development of a potential new force structure at Ebbing Airfield at Fort Smith to bring jobs and Air Force infrastructure uh, to Fort Smith, Arkansas, the flooding that happened a little over a year ago down there where I personally went down and helped sandbag so that we could bring relief to the, the people of the second largest city of our state. In Northwest Arkansas, issues regarding I-49 and 412, trying to get infrastructure in place so that we can move people around our area. The VA pathologist and the issues that, that he created uh, for a lot of our veterans at the Fayetteville Veterans Affairs Office. The more recent announcement of the infrastructure that's going in in the northeast part of my district for the telephone companies that are bringing broadband to dozens and dozens of families in rural Arkansas. These are the things that are important to everyday Arkansans that don't show up on the national radar. I think I'm the best person qualified to continue to carry these missions forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Womack. Uh, Mr. Clogg, yes, you're close. Well, well, like I said, you already stole my thunder for my closing remarks, so I'm just going to have to wing it. Um, I, I'm kind of surprised with some of the things that Congressman Womack has said about knowing his district. It's, it's good that he helped sandbag. I've done that too. Uh, I volunteer about 100 calls every year with the fire department, helping the people in the district as well. He talked about VA issues, and, uh, and I'd like to see him take an actual interest in those because I was one of those veterans that was treated by that pathologist in the VA hospital where, uh, where, little, was done, where little was done about it. So, and the issues at the VA are far greater than that. In fact, I would challenge him. When Obamacare passed, it took away my health care. It made private health care so expensive I could no longer afford it. And so the only thing I had left was my VA health care. And let me tell you that I, I feel bad for all those veterans that are stuck with just that as their health care. Government rationing of health care does not work very well. And that's something that Mr. Womack has been in office for 10 years, and he hasn't done anything to make it any better. There's been lip service, but nothing better. I would challenge you, drop your health insurance. Drop that Cadillac plan they give you for being in Congress. Drop your Medicare. Get all of your health care from the VA. Then maybe you can understand what's going on in your district and what's going on at the VA. Do what I do. Live that life. Make it to where the only medical care you get is what you've inflicted on us with that. So it is time for a change. He's brought up a lot of issues that are important that we need to keep our eye on, but that he hasn't done anything about in the 10 years he's been in office. And it's not like anything's going to change if we elect Celeste either. It's going to be more of the same. It's been that way all along. It hasn't mattered whether we elect Democrats or Republicans. We get the same more government, less freedoms, higher taxes. Right now, the country is literally burning. People are dying. We're killing each other, divided left and right. The only way to stop that is to take the parties out of power the only way to do that is to put third parties in power. I want you to be the change that you want to see in the world. Be libertarian with me. Thank you very much, sir. And that concludes our Arkansas PBS debate in the third congressional district for the district. We thank our three candidates and our panel of journalists as well. Coming tomorrow, the campaign for the U.S. Senate. Arkansas PBS will live stream at 3 o'clock at our YouTube channel, and you can find all our election information at myarkansaspbs.org backslash elections. You can also watch the broadcast at 7 p.m. For now, for all of us at Arkansas PBS, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Major funding for Election 2020 Arkansas PBS Debates provided by AARP Arkansas.
I've been told that I've been permitted to make a statement, and I don't have one. <laughs> so that I've, I've got 10 minutes in here. Fire away. It was distracting at first a little bit, but but now now it's not quite as bad. There we go. You say anything inappropriate, they can bleep it out with a delay. With a delay, yeah. I I guess I should have tested that so we could have taken advantage of it. So wh whatever questions you've got, go ahead and go ahead and shoot. Uh, you've done this before. Yes. And uh, when has it run? Um. It's good. It's it's not so much what I've learned. It's it's good to to have to have discourse. To to have all the candidates in the same room answering the same questions at the same time, where people can see what their answers are and how they interact with each other and with the people that are asking those questions. So that's the the main thing. Isn't isn't what isn't necessarily what you learn. It's it's the experience that you have, the opportunity that you have to hear your candidate or your opponents say in their own words exactly what they're what they're doing and uh and giving the people that hear a, a chance to know exactly what all of the candidates stand for and 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 how well they interact with each other i, I will say i did i did learn one thing right after the debate was over um i know i accused mr womack of of having a cadillac plan with congress he's informed me that the only health care plan that he has is tricare which is what he gets as a military retiree um, I, I wouldn't call TRICARE a Cadillac plan. It's still way better than what you get in the VA, but uh, I, I don't want to disparage any veterans that are, that are on TRICARE. I've got family members that are on TRICARE. I think that would be a better option than the VA. When, uh, when our veterans get out of service, just, just put them straight into TRICARE. We don't need the VA at all. Um, that would save a fortune and provide better health care for, for all the veterans that are getting out of the service. Um, the Supreme Court confirmation hearings, um, by the Senate going on right now of Judge Amy Coney Barrett. And many Democrats fear that her nomination, um, with her nomination, the Affordable Care Act will be overturned. If it is overturned, what's a better replacement? Um, and I was expecting a health care question in there in the debate. We really, we really didn't get the question I was expecting. Um, <laughs> so um, our health care system is a mess, and the problem is, is that everything we're doing is trying to address health care insurance. We're doing insurance reform. We're not doing health care reform. Um, and that's causing huge amounts of expenses that aren't going to actual health care. We spend roughly, in tax dollars, about $600 billion a year on Medicaid. So that's huge. The, the thing with that is, is that less than $300 billion of that actually goes to any kind of health care. As far as prescription drugs, I think is like 4 or $5 billion of that. So doctor care hospital care, um, you know, primary care, all, all, your, all your emergency hospitalizations, it adds up to less than half of that. We spend over $300 billion a year on managing the health care, which is just rationing. So over half of the Medicaid budget goes to that. We could cut our Medicaid budget in half, stop using it as insurance, and we would have $100 million to spend on every single county on direct health care. We, we could do free clinics and free hospitals, financed $100 million a year, and cut Medicaid spending in half. That's what I want to see the debate go to. I, I, I don't like everything focusing on health care insurance reform and how much more rationing we're going to get or who's going to get to do most of the rationing. That, that's not going to help us at all. What, what we need is better health care. And the way to do that is is completely separate from the arguments and discussions we're having. How do you do that, though, and keep all the insurance companies and keep all the insurance salesmen and keep all the various? Uh, oh, you, you, you let them you let them still run in a free market. Um, as I said in the debate, I, I had decent health insurance at one point. It was private market health insurance. I had dozens of plans from every provider that I could choose from so that I could custom, you know, custom tailor one that fit me. So, and it worked fantastic. About 10 years ago, I ruptured my appendix. I had private market insurance that I'd tailored just for me. I was able to see my own personal physician. He recommended a surgeon, and that was the surgeon that I got to pick to do my emergency surgery to save my life. 
I don't get that option anymore. People don't have that option anymore. So health insurance plan, I don't want to eliminate health insurance. I want to get the government to quit screwing them up. You know, let, let them go back into the market to offer plans that work for people that people can buy. People should be able to have insurance. I don't want to take away anybody's insurance. I just don't want the government setting what kind of insurance you have and then financing it. Let people buy their own insurance. Salesmen can still sell their own insurance. They'll have options to sell, so they'll actually have something to do. Insurance companies will still be insuring things. They'll still be making a profit. Nonprofit insurance companies will still be making no profit, but still providing insurance. You can still have health co-ops. All those things that we always had, we can still have. But just by getting the government out of it, we can still have a safety net at half the cost. And we'd have a better safety net at half the cost. Well, feel, feel free to ask more. There's, there's only a few of you in I'm here. I'm just going to note that I, I, I saw you grin when you brought up the veterans thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, that, Considering your background, that, that did surprise that was, me. That was not a happy grin. That was an angry no, grin. No, that was like a, yeah, that, that, I'm not implying that it was. Yeah, that, that was an angry grin. Now I can't believe you brought that up. You're yeah, um, the, 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 the VA system is a mess. Yeah. Um, as I said when I first came in, and you missed that part, Con Congressman Womack told me after the debate that he doesn't have a Cadillac plan, that he just uses the TRICARE that he gets as a military retiree. So, and, and, and like I said, I don't want to disparage anybody that's on TRICARE. If, if, if that's true, um, tri TRICARE is a program that I think we should shift the VA to. Just eliminate the VA as a program completely altogether. Yeah. Let them keep the hospitals, let them operate on their own independently. So, but give every veteran that leaves TRICARE, set, set the percentages and the, and the deductibles depending on whatever their, uh, you know, their, their disability when they get out is. If you're 100% disabled, you get 100% coverage. If you're not at all disabled, then you get less coverage. You, you know, you're more responsible for yourself. But we could do that with TRICARE and eliminate the mess that we have with, v, with VA care as it is. The, the military doesn't communicate with the VA very well. The systems don't line up at all. And so we lose veterans that are coming out of the service and trying to go into the VA because they can't communicate with each other. No one knows what the other one is doing. And as I've found in the VA system, the VA doesn't communicate with anybody else either, not just the military. They don't communicate with Many. private providers very well either. Um, in March, uh, I had heart surgery. So I now have an, an implanted I, I have an implanted defibrillator now. And, and I have had nothing but problems with the VA since getting that done. I've had problems where my, where my dissolved oxygen in my blood craters. Mm. But the VA refused, it, it is a serious problem, but the VA refused to do a study to, to, to follow it because COVID restrictions said, well, we can't do that here. So I said, fine, send me out to a community care. That's the, you know, the Veterans Choice Program, you're supposed to let me do that. They said, no, we can't do that because because that's a service we normally provide here and you don't live far enough away, we're not going to authorize that. And so I had to go out and I had to pay for it on my own. How much is that? I'm sorry, I can't ask that. Just private medical place. I, I, I don't care. I spent, I spent a couple hundred dollars on that. Okay. I got a sleep study done. The sleep study said that I should get a, uh, at the same time, because when, when you do the study for overnight dissolved oxygen, they do the sleep study too. It measures your respirations. They, should, they said that I should go on a, on a, sleep apnea machine okay. so which the VA also refused to do so I had to buy that one out of my pocket as well How much was that? Um, I think that was four or five hundred dollars for the machine yeah. so I mean I'm fortunate enough that I can pay for that out of my pocket I, I, I can do that mm -hmm. so I mean it's it's not comfortable throwing out that much money especially since I'm not really bringing in much money anymore I'm I retired, I took my retirement as a lump sum, I live off how I saved my money. Um, but, but I am fortunate that I can pay for that. Not everybody is. And I went through, I went through uh, Senator Bozeman's office to say, look, you're denying veterans health care. Mm -hmm. You're refusing to do it there and then you're refusing to send them out for, you know, fix that. And all I wanted to do was fix it for me, not for anybody else that are in the system. It's just, it's horrible what we are doing to our veterans. Absolutely horrible. 
remind me um, just shoot you an email uh, if you don't hear from any of their activities remind me uh, they set up a sentencing case for Dr. Lee it's sometime in, in December if you don't know already I'll send you the well I, I'm also fortunate in the fact that even though I was one of his patients so apparently I dodged the bullet and he, he didn't mess up any of my pathology. Yeah. So my, my issues are separate from that. Yeah, I understand. I understand. I just so, you and, and my problem is, is that we had a VA system that knew that they had a problem with that doctor and retained him anyway. And then when they had the second problem with him for the same thing, they still kept him there and they kept the veterans in the dark for months. Like Congressman Womack knew that the pathologist had messed up those things before I did, even though I was his patient. Okay. On your time. Oh. Flockwood, I didn't know you were here. Good for you. Yeah. Came all the way here just for this, didn't he? Just a few other things. Basically, we've seen a lot of the White House having these meetings and there are people packed jam packed together. Man, I was in one of them. Well, um, we, we, first of all, we should, do a, we, we should all do a better job of protecting ourselves against COVID, uh, including in those settings. The, the, the time I found myself in the setting was at the Republican Convention on the South Lawn. The problem was is that we were packed in like sardines and it was hot and muggy. For those of you that have been to Washington knows it can get that way. And as a result of that, man, I had to take my mask off because it was hard for me to breathe uh, if it hadn't been for that. And I was pretty careful not to interact too much with my neighbors. I had my pillow guy right behind me. I had Herschel Walker right in front of me. So uh, I, I did interact with him a little bit, but, but not, not too much. I was more concerned that night about leaving the grounds because first time in my adult life, even with a deployment under my hands, that I actually feared for my life uh, because of the mob that uh, surrounded me. Of course, I'm in a suit and tie and headed off down by the Willard and, and it was obvious where I was coming from. So, uh, but no, we, we, we should all do a better job of that and be mindful of the fact that uh, the more we can distance and the more we can protect ourselves with a mask, mask either in a restaurant or in a public setting or outdoors or whatever, that, uh, that, that we, we do have a pretty good chance of limiting this spread. Uh, but I also think it, we, we should be mindful of the fact that um, we still have an economy to operate. We still have business to transact. And there are things, using those practices, there are things that we should be doing and doing more to make sure that um, we can keep our business alive, keep our economy on track, uh, and continue to be able to provide sources of income to people who have mortgage payments and car payments and kids to you know deal with, put through college and those kinds of things. So. But, but I do think there are things that we can do a little bit better. Hey, we are doing better. We're doing better now than we were when it started. And if this persists, and I expect that it will, that I think we'll be doing even better in the future to help protect ourselves from the problem. So Congressman, what do we learn from COVID this time and what are we gonna do different for a next time? Well, the. To me, the biggest take, there are a lot of takeaways, but the biggest one of all is that we cannot rely on offshore supply of critical PPE and materiel to include vac you know, things that go into vaccines and, and what have you. And that's unfortunate that so much of what we've done, particularly in the textile industry, we've just pushed overseas. 
and bringing that we got to bring some of that back to the country i don't i'm not real sure how we do that because obviously the private sector would love to do it if they could make it work so government's probably going to have to have to play some kind of a role in that and i don't know necessarily what that will be in a bigger picture uh and i've advocated this as an appropriator particularly when i was on the labor age subcommittee is that we don't do a very good job in this country First of all, we don't do a very good job of budgeting at all, but we certainly don't do a very good job of budgeting for um, emergencies. And we know every year we're going to have hurricanes and tornadoes and wildfires, but in our process, we do not put money aside, and there's a formula that you could use that would be plus or minus. We don't put money aside to say, okay, when this happens, this is the pot of money we're going to take it from. We have to do supplementals for it. And those become bogged down politically, as evidenced by the fact that even right now, to this moment, we have 130 plus billion dollars sitting in an account for PPP, but the program has run out. So the authorization ran out in August, and yet we still have uncommitted funds of 130 billion, and we have and we have businesses that are struggling and need another round of that PPP, and we and we should be delivering that for them. There's a standalone bill that we should be putting through Congress right now, but. Speaker Pelosi has it held up. I've signed the discharge petition to bring it to the floor, but we're short, you know, probably 25 or 30 uh, uh, signers in, in order to do that. But, uh, but I think the biggest takeaway, Yuna, is we cannot, when, when we have a problem at home, the answer to the problem cannot be offshore. It's got to be here at home. But fortunately, even in my district, we've had places like Prino Ricard, that stepped up the plate and retooled part of its line in mixing adult beverages to doing hand sanitizer. Uh, and then there are other examples. We've uh, John L. Hunt's uh, son-in-law in Rogers doing the same thing at the at the distillery there in Rogers, over on uh, on, on one of those side streets by the promenade. We we have many examples in our country of people stepping up to the plate. A lot of companies have gone into the ventilator production when ventilators were such a problem. Now, the resiliency of our country is amazing, but if you're having to rely on a supply chain that is structured overseas, uh, then, then we become dependent on someone other than ourselves, and that's unfortunate. I think we can do a better job of that. Now, you said national debt is a huge problem. Um, you want to cut spending. What's the first program you would cut from if you were in charge? Well, Look, when you get into the, I, I hesitate to say a program, but, but, but for when you're in the situation we're in, everything has to be on the table. But here are the inconvenient truths that I try to speak to the people that I talk to. One is that the issues that we're facing are not, um, are not caused by discretionary spending. That's the spending that the Appropriations Committee does on an annual, is supposed to do on an annual basis. We're not real good at that either. But that's another story. The issues with deficits is more related to the fact that on the mandatory side of the equation, and that's where you find Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, net interest on the debt, some retirement programs, and so on, is it is, uh, it, it is running without any, uh, any boundaries at all. There, there are no no, uh, no ability to control the growth of that because it literally takes a, a decision by Congress to change those rules. That's why in that budget I tested just doing something small like raising the age of eligibility from 65 to 67 on Medicare. It doesn't solve the problem, but it buys you a little bit more time. If you can't have an appetite to do something like that, which is very, very small and incremental, then doing the big things may be difficult. Big things. What are they? Means testing. I mean, let's, are we going to have that conversation? And where will that take us? Because people will say, wait a minute, I paid into that program. You know, uh, th that's my program. Um, whether or not revenues will have to come to the table eventually to solve some of these problems. You know, on highway infrastructure, Doug, as you well know, it's about how do you fund the highway trust fund? Mm -hmm. We do it with a gasoline tax, a federal tax. It was last raised in 93 and never indexed to inflation. So now with inflation, even small inflation, what, that dollar in 93, what does it raise today? It, it, and the costs associated have gone up. So you, you see the point. We, we have to do a better job 
of, uh, of forecasting what the needs, what the emerging needs of the country are and what our limited resources are, and only as a last resort should we be going back to the taxpayers and say, cough up more of your money. Um, so I'm a strong advocate for having the serious adult-level conversation about Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, not in terms of cutting them, but in restructuring these programs for long-term sustainability. Two data points. Social Security Trust Fund is going to be insolvent, meaning it can't pay 100 percent of benefits. Now they say 2031. It was about 2032 or 3 before COVID. Now 2031. That's in 10 years. It's before you can draw Social Security, you know, okay? Well before. The, the other program that's more imminent is the Part A of Medicare, Hospital Insurance Trust Fund. It runs out in 2024. So in the next presidential term, we'll have to come to grips with we don't have enough money to pay what's due to the Medicare Part A beneficiary. So, it, look, if I wanted to cut the programs, I would do exactly what the Democrats are advocating. I would do nothing, and they're going to get cut on their own. But, look, I see this train wreck about to happen, and I know it's going to happen. It's foretold in the numbers. And we have to make some decisions now because if you wait to the last minute, uh, the decisions could be and will be more draconian in nature and be a lot more urgent. In, in, in other words, we're going to scare the you-know-what out of a lot of people before Congress gets around to acting on the solution. We just put, look, the, the varsity sport of Congress on any subject is kick the can. And we're good at it. Because we just, you know, there's always a convenient date down the road to kick it past. Right now it's an election. Then it will be inauguration. Then it will be, oh, we, you know, the, the next fiscal year is October 1. We'll, we'll wait till then. Uh, we got to start acting now. It's our Article 1 responsibility. We ought to be doing it. Can I just ask one more question? Sure. Yeah, pack the court. Yeah. What is your response to that? Harry Reid started every bit of this. Let's, let's go back in history now. Harry Reid started this nuclear option in 2013. Now, it wasn't Supreme Court at the time. It was political appointees, but Supreme Court came in, what, 17, wasn't it, Doug? Uh, I think it was 17. Now, if, if they don't get their way now and their answer is to pack the Supreme Court and do away with the filibuster, and oh, while we're at it, why don't we put a couple of Senate seats in the District of Columbia and a couple of Senate seats in Puerto Rico, or maybe more, you know, depending on how you divide that, uh, that territory. Um, if that's the answer, then, then we, will have, um, we, we, we will have some uh, – the, 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 the country is going to go through a period of, uh, of very deep division. And I, and I worry about that. I mean, we're seeing, I mean, my gosh, the Lakers can't even win a championship without somebody tearing up police cars in celebration. Um, I, I fear for the civil disobedience that will follow if, um, if either side of the aisle decides to go way beyond matters of reason because they don't like a certain outcome. Why can't we just have elections? accept the results of the elections, and if you don't like it, do your best to win it back the next time around and, uh, and go back to your huddle and come up with a better play. Why can't we do that? But it's an imperfect world, and, and we know it's shirts and skins right now, and, and, uh, and I'm going to do my part to represent what I believe is the majority opinion of the people that I represent, and that's uh, a, a pretty reliably conservative third district. We are out of time. Thank you. All the best.
everybody is distanced enough. If you're okay with it, I'll take my mask yes, off. Okay. Yes. And I will just take questions if you guys want to do that. And nice to see you. <laughs> about the idea of adding additional, it's nice to see you, uh, adding some additional Supreme Court seats beyond the nine. You know, I, my bias is always to sort of honor the tradition of how it's been. I also think that there have sort of been ways of packing the court with conservatives, like denying Merrick Garland a hearing. Um, but I think what's, what is more important to think about is the questions that will be put before the Supreme Court. And, you know, the Affordable Care Act will be discussed soon. And I think that really worries people that they may lose their health care. And so I think that's probably a, a bigger issue than the, who that justice is, which that person obviously will be deciding on that. If elected, would you be open to possibly adding justices? Oh. You know, I think that like I said, I, I just really hesitate to go down that road and change the structure of our institutions, so. Um, while we're on this topic, mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of fear because of the hearings that are going on mm -hmm. right now that the Affordable Care Act could be overturned. Mm -hmm. If it is, well, what do we do to replace it or what's the next step? So we have to have a functional Congress that will pass legislation to make sure immediately that people do not lose their health care coverage. And then we also have to make sure that we're addressing the flaws that were in the Affordable Care Act, um, making sure that we're addressing cost, and that we also then tackle the cost of prescription drug coverage, um, dental coverage, better mental health care, and um, also have a conversation about long-term long -term care coverage because a lot of um, families, especially in my age range, are really struggling with the cost of um, child care for their small children, and then they're sort of sandwiched with the trying to care for their aging parents. And I think there are a lot of people in that same situation that we need to address the actual issues that families are facing in their lives. I find that concerning. I certainly think that democracy is the best form of government. Um, I was concerned when he ran for office the first time that he um, was very concerned about in-person voter fraud and now is con you know, alleging fraud for mail-in ballots as well. And certainly free and fair our election, elections are the cornerstone of our democracy. And we need to make sure that we are protecting and strengthening our democracy rather than undermining it. in Georgia. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry, you know. Um, are you, can? do you, as far as you can tell, things going to go smoothly here? You know, I trust our local 
um, election officials. I think that they do a really good job. And I think that really when you think about how our elections are run, it's really messy in some ways, but it does safeguard our election as well in that we don't have a federalized election system. It is controlled by state and local officials. And I think that does provide some protection in there and help keep local people accountable. Mm -hmm. But every election commission in the state has two Republicans and one Democrat. Yes. But you sound confident that they're... I think that they are good people that want to make sure that, that, that we get the right results, not necessarily the right now results, mm -hmm. and that we can trust our election system. Uh, at the end of the debate today, Congressman Womack reeled off this long list of local projects and local mm -hmm. priorities. Fair play here. Tell us what you think the big issues of the third district, mm -hmm. and so specific to the third district is Egan Megan. What do you think the big issues are? So I think I have a very different perspective than Congressman Womack. Um, you know, I I am still working, and as a family nurse practitioner, I see people from across the socioeconomic. Uh, per, scale, you know, from the very poor to the very wealthy. And certainly the, the common thing that I hear um, is that they want to make sure that health care costs are addressed. You know, nobody should go broke just because they get sick. Um, I certainly hear a lot of concern about the cost of prescription medications. And then I just hear a lot of people who are exhausted by the political process and they just want normal people to represent them and feel frustrated that they aren't being heard and you know a lot of the problems that I see in my practice are things that I cannot solve in an exam room you know I can't write a prescription and get somebody a better job I can't write a prescription and let somebody have health insurance and be able to leave the job that they have where they have health insurance benefits and go start a new entrepreneurial endeavor. And I think that we lose a lot of innovation by tying our health care to employment. No, it's not. Now, you're running for U.S. representative. I mean, you representative is in the job now. Mm -hmm. What makes you think you'd be a better representative of this district than the Republican? Because I think that I have a deeper understanding of the problems that people face in their lives. You know, I hear people in their moments of vulnerability or fear if they get a bad diagnosis that I've had to deliver. Mm -hmm. They share their hopes and their dreams with me. You know, healthcare is incredibly personal and intimate. Yeah. And I think that they recognize in me a life similar to their own and they know that they can trust me to listen and to give them honest answers, even when they're painful answers. And I think that's really important to have someone who listens. And certainly, I don't, I'm not running for Congress just to represent Democrats. I'm running for Congress to represent every person in the 3rd Congressional District. Okay. Well, we've got to go 
know we've got at least one more thing. Um, <laughs> Congressman, where's the time keeping? Oh, we're doing good. <laughs> Congressman Womack said, look, COVID came, we didn't have a game plan. Mm -hmm. South Korea mm -hmm. apparently did, or I quickly made up one. Germany did, or quickly made up. Now I understand this is a really, really big nation with a federal system of government where the states have a lot of power, okay? Mm -hmm. But um, even countries in Africa where they don't have a hospital in every town and a medical clinic on every corner did a better job because they frankly took an infectious disease seriously. Yes. Okay? So, low, pardon the loaded question, but what do you think of that? Well, we didn't have a game plan argument. I vehemently disagree. And this is the United States of America. We are watching other countries outperform us by orders of magnitude. And they don't have better technology, better nurses and doctors. They don't have more manufacturing. They don't have more intellectual resources and experts there. But what they had were leaders who took this pandemic seriously. You know, our president knew in January that this was worse than the flu. And he didn't tell the American people that. And I liken that to if I had ordered a mammogram on one of my patients, and I knew that it was abnormal, but I didn't tell her because I didn't want her to panic. And that's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. It left us flat-footed. It left us unprepared. And our experts were undercut at every We have so much expertise within the CDC and NIH. And those officials have not been heard. They've not been respected. And I don't believe that science should be politicized like this. Truth is neither liberal nor conservative. Thank you. And we are out of time. Can I ask? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would just say that, you know, for those in the third congressional district, I would like them to know that maybe they haven't voted for a Democrat in the past. Maybe they never have, but I bet they know a nurse, and I would ask them to vote for a nurse. And I'll quit. Thank you all so much.